thanks for having me. Uh, so in my talk, I would like to discuss an approach on how to model medieval personal agents uh, in relation to, uh, to, to places. And uh, this is, of course, uh, to consider the complexities of localizing pre-modern individuals, uh, which are coming firstly from ambiguity in the source material, and secondly, from a certain degree of mobility of the individuals. And uh, yeah, as uh, Georg Vogler already said, I'm working in a research project on the cultural historical role of coats of arms uh, with a main focus on the Middle Ages. And in this project, we are building a, a semantic web database that shall, uh, um, among other things, that shall uh, represent uh, the bearers of coats of arms in their historical context. And uh, the underlying complexity of this is, implies a strong inter interlinkage between historical persons, groups, and places. And for example, if a single coat of arms represents the rights that is a specific person had over a specific territory. And so simply put, if we, if we want to, to make use of, of them, uh, of coats of arms as a historical source, we need to locate the place a bearer of a coat of arms came from. But a single historical person was seldom interlinked with only one place, but rather with multiple places and territories. And uh, this interlinkage has, of course, to be represented in the semantic web database I mentioned before. Only then can we actually use it as a means to create new historical knowledge, and knowledge that is not only about heritage as a system of science in itself, but also about, uh, about the agents and spaces involved in it. Um, so could, let's consider one person as a concrete example to better understand the historical complexity we are dealing with as well as uh, sorry to do you want to interrupt uh, yes you uh, are switching slides or not uh, not yet okay sorry i, I will in a, uh, in a few okay, seconds <laughs> but uh, thank you um yeah so let's consider uh, one um, concrete person now to better understand the historical complexity we're dealing with uh, as well as possible solutions from a data modeling perspective. Uh, we will look at uh, Konrad uh, II of Kreik, an Austrian nobleman associated with the Holy Roman Empire. And now you should see a new slide. Uh, I hope so. Um, so we know that uh, Konrad of Kreik uh, belonged to one of the most important noble families in the Duchy of Carinthia, uh, which is Kurt Canton today. Um, where he himself also held uh, noble offices. And also the family of Kreik had their Stammsitz located in the Duchy of Carinthia. Uh, this may be regarded as their supposed center of power and main residence. And also we know the Duchy of Carinthia uh, actually belonged to Habsburg-controlled Austria at the time. Um, so let's now try to put these facts into a data model based on evidence from a single historical source. Um, here we have a page from the Amorial Belonville. Um, Amorials uh, were medieval manuscripts that, or pre-modern manuscripts, that uh, included collections of coats of arms, um, sometimes by also depicting hierarchical relations between the represented, represented actors, like uh, you can see here. And uh, on this page, we see the coat of arms of the Duke of, of Austria uh, uh, with his um, uh, with his retinue, uh, which includes also um, the coat of arms of Konrad of Kreik. And an unsophisticated model to represent the relations between the source, the personal actor, and the place Austria uh, may look like this. Um, no, a source mentions uh, a place and the person in question, and from that we can, fer, uh, we can infer a relation between the person and the place. But um, what does this uh, relation between person and place actually mean? I said before that Konrad of Kreik was an Austrian nobleman, but uh, when we include other sources about him, it becomes evident that such allocations are not feasible, or at least they don't cover every aspect. Um, Konrad of Kreik uh, does, for example, also appear in a charter from 1379. And uh, here he is granted Lomnitz uh, as a fiefdom, uh, from Wenzelaus IV, and at this time Wenzelaus was king of Bohemia, Bohemia as well as a uh, Roman German king, and Lomnitz now lies in the north of Slovakia, um, and was part of uh, the kingdom of Bohemia uh, at the time of our interest. Um, so Konrad of Trike is to be associated with at least two um, different lords, no? the um, 
uh, King Wenceslaus and uh, the Duke of Austria. He's uh, associated with these two different lords, which results in um, two different associated place entities. And uh, furthermore, we can add another layer of complex complexity when we extend our interest to other noblemen Konrad of Reich interacted with. To exemplify this, I will introduce a third source, um, this time another section of the manuscript uh, Amorio Belleville we used before. And here we can find uh, another evidence of, for Konrad of Reich through his coat of arms. And in this context, he is part of a so-called occasional role role of arms, which is a list of coat of arms whose bearers were associated through one common specific event or occasion. And um, there is uh, some scholarly debate on the nature of the occasion of this particular role of arms uh, is based on. Um, here for clarity reasons, uh, we will focus on a newer hypothesis regarding it as a list of members of a tournament that took place in, in London in uh, 1358. And uh, as a short side note, in any case, this source can be extremely interesting for, for us from, from a um, perspective of historical research. It uh, relates to events that brought nobles together from different places of Europe. And if we want, for example, to study where all these people um, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, occasional role, where all these people came from, um, we have to account for the modeling of their place concerning the occasion and as well for the modeling of the places they are mainly associated with. Uh, so now, as you can see, we have uh, at least three different places Konrad of Trike is associated with. And furthermore, our example actor is associated with each place through a completely different uh, role and in a completely different context. So let's take a, a, step, uh, a step back again and try to make this relation between actor and place more explicit. Normally, we would uh, deal with uh, these three, three layers uh, of a data model presented here, the historical source or the assertion about fact, the personal actor and the place. <clears throat> and uh, to, to account for the complexi complexity I just illustrated, we need to include an additional layer that describes the role this actor fulfill fulfills in a specific historical context. And uh, each role they have, um, like being part of a retinue, being a vessel, being part of a military campaign or being part of a tournament, each of these roles explains their relation to one or more places, and it's relevant and uh, yeah, and is relevant during du during a specific time frame. And uh, self evidently, our historical source provides us with uh, with this context um, for the role. And uh, to implement uh, this role and context now in a more concrete data model, we can make use of the event based orientation of the CIDOC CRM. This has, of course, the advantage that we are able to guarantee interoperability, interoperability and inferencing with other data, data sets that are also using CIDOC. And to exemplify this uh, also in a more clear manner, I will uh, only use the, the charter of charter of enforcement uh, and the occasional role of, role of arms I um, introduced before. So yeah, that's our source material. Aside from the source, we also have our actor, of course. And uh, we have the, the two places um, he's uh, associated with and uh, the roles Konrad uh, of Kreik fulfilled in relation to these places. Um, yeah, one time he has a, a fiefdom and one time he has participant in a tournament. And uh, since we would need or build up a taxonomy of roles over time, I use the um, E55 type class in this case, uh, in a, which yeah, is in accordance with the CIDOC CRM rules. And this deciding which roles to use in which context is naturally an act of scholarly interpretation. It comes from the study and interpretation of the historical sources that provide a context for a specific role, role in relation to one or more specific, specific places. And um, now we could, of course, simply connect uh, actor, place, and type. Um, but then we would be back at our model from the start and we'd lose this historical context in which a certain role is important. And uh, to model this context now, we can use the type assignment class from CIDOC CM. And in the CIDOC logic, this is considered as a temporal entity um, on an event. And uh, since this is this event is representing our context, which depends on multiple other facts, we have to conceptualize this as a pair durant entity. So in 
entity that has not a lasting existence. And a type assignment can now work as a connector class between different instances that are involved in the assignment of a type to an entity. We can, for example, state that the context of the fiefdom assigns the role of Lord of the fiefdom to Conrad of Krijk, and that the charter, um, you can see here, the charter from the uh, earlier example was decisive for, for this particular assignment of a role. And uh, also type assignment is a subclass of space-time volume, which is also a concept from Cytox CRM, uh, which models a temporal entity that has also some spatial extent. And therefore we can state that a certain role like participating in a tour tournament uh, can, can also be applied to one or more places, uh, as you can see, as you can see here. And lastly, we can of course add other temporal entities to the, uh, to place um, the role he fulfills in the context of time, which can be other events or a time span. Uh, and um, as you can see, this can all be incorporated into existing CIDOC CRM classes and concepts and done so in a pretty straightforward way. We are not talking about a general new approach to data modeling or to modeling cultural data, but about a specific view on the historical entities we are dealing with and how this specific view uh, can, can shape our data models. And uh, to conclude now, let's uh, consider a few aspects regarding historical analysis. Uh, such a model allows us to query our data in a more flexible way, since we can distinguish between agents and the places and spaces they were associated with, uh, but we can distinguish between them through, uh, through uh, the roles they, they fulfill in a certain context. But uh, these roles have, of course, different meanings and implications and are not necessarily comparable to each other. For example, the fiefdom in our case could be considered mainly as an additional legal and economic sphere of influence for our actor Konrad of Krijk, but uh, it does not have to be considered as his uh, main center of power. And uh, to draw lines between these differences and uh, to assess them would therefore be a central part of developing a research question and of deciding which parts of the data are to be queried at all. The significance of hermeneutical historical interpretation is therefore not only relevant with regard to the decision of what agent to space relations we are able to, to, to model from the historical sources or how it should classify these uh, relations. Um, historical interpretation would also be relevant in deciding on which level of granularity the data can be queried at all, meaning which data fight historical contexts and roles are comparable to each, to each other and which are not. And at this point, we can uh, illustrate again the interlinkage of the structure of the data and the questions we can ask it, forcing us to formulate our research questions as clearly as possible based on our data models. Yeah, thank you very much.